Hi everybody. So today we're going to talk about antipsychotic medications. Um, lots to go over with these. We're just going to touch on some issues. We're mostly going to focus on uh, schizophrenia um, as far as treatments, but as you've already seen from some of our other lectures, these are medications that are used for a wide variety of different disorders, and the chapter gave you a nice uh, summary of that as well. I don't want to talk about that too much just because I know several of you are doing presentations um, on those topics, but the goal for today is really to look at the antipsychotic classes, the three main, um, I guess, um, generations of antipsychotics, talk about some of the pros and cons, some of the side effects, and just what to look for. So just to give you a very brief background on schizophrenia, I know you guys know it pretty well, but schizophrenia affects about 1-2% to of the population, and um, you know, it's, the hallucinations, delusions are probably the symptoms that are be, you know, best known or most as, associated with schizophrenia. But there are other notable symptoms. Uh, one of these is dissociative thinking. So this is a condition seen in schizophrenia that is characterized by disturbances of thought and difficulty relating events properly. Um, as far as the hallucinations, the auditory hallucinations are much more common than the visual hallucinations. And these hallucinations are almost always negative in content. Um, you also will see cognitive deficits often with schizophrenia. And the onset is usually the late teens to the early to mid 20s. Um, there are two types of symptoms. There are positive symptoms and negative symptoms. So positive symptoms are symptoms or behaviors that are gained, that are additional to what people typically have. So these are things like the hallucinations, the delusions, and perhaps excited motor behavior. Now there are also negative symptoms, which are the loss of function or a reduction of uh, functions that people typically have. So this can be slowed thought and speech, um, emotional and social withdrawal, and a reduced level of affect. Now I bring these up because uh, for many of the medications we'll talk about, you know, they're pretty decent with the positive symptoms, but we don't have a lot of great medications for the negative symptoms. And um, as you'll see, um, there are times that the book will say that something's good for the negative symptoms. I'm often, I'm often a little bit um, more cautious. It's, it's sometimes hard to say when you're, especially when you're comparing one antipsychotic to another, if um, it's an improvement in the negative symptoms or if it's just fewer side effects. So just keep that in mind. But we do pretty well with the positive symptoms. We struggle with the negative symptoms. So there are significant brain differences um, observed with schizophrenia. So the one that's probably best known is that the cerebral ventr ventricles are enlarged, especially in men. And this will, this remains after the initial uh, disease onset. So here you can see two um, brain scans and you see a significant difference in the ventricles, even though these are actually identical twins. So why does this happen? Well, the thought is that the larger ventricles appear to be a result of the neighboring brain areas being smaller. For instance, the hippocampus and the amygdala are both smaller in individuals with schizophrenia. There are also abnormalities in the parahippocampal regions and other areas within the limbic system. You can also see the pyramidal cells within the hippocampus showing uh, characteristic disorganization. That's what you see here in this other picture. Um, and these factors are thought to occur early in development and may account for some of the cognitive deficits that we see in the disorder. So now we're going to get into some hypotheses. Uh, there are several different hypotheses for schizophrenia. Um, and 
as you'll see, there are arguments for and against pretty much every hypothesis, but they're important because a lot of the treatments that we see touch on aspects of these um, hypotheses. So, with this, you know, we do see some other brain differences in individuals with schizophrenia, such as a thicker corpus callosum. So due to this and due to consistent findings that individuals with schizophrenia have less activation in their frontal lobes, there's what is called the hypofrontality hypothesis. So what this is is um, essentially that there's less activation, underactivation in individuals with schizophrenia. So what's, what's evidence for this? Well, in identical twins, only the one with schizophrenia typically shows hypofrontality. So it seems to be a symptom of the disorder and not a direct genetic cause. It, you know, if it's genetic, of course, you'd assume it'd be in both twins. And during cognitive during difficult cognitive tasks, individuals with schizophrenia don't see an increase in activation above their resting levels, so their brain doesn't gear up like it does for other people, which may be part of the reason why there are cognitive impairments with the disorder. Also, drugs that seem to help schizophrenia, which we'll talk about, also seem to increase activation in the frontal lobe. So, as you likely know by now, there's a lot we know about the brain that's correlational in nature. We see two things that seem to co-occur and assume that one is causing the other. Though, we in psychology, of course, know that a correlation does not equal causation. In this vein, one of the methods that's been used to look at or to look for a cause of schizophrenia is looking for medications that cause similar symptoms. We know that drugs like LSD and other hallucinogens cause hallucinations, but they differ a fair amount from schizophrenia, um, which has more disorganized thinking, auditory hallucinations, and paranoia. However, these are the symptoms you see when someone has taken very high doses of amphetamines, and thus are su suffering from an amphetamine psychosis. The fact that amphetamine psychosis and schizophrenia appear similar has led many to think that they may have a common cause. So, how do amphetamines work? As you may remember, amphetamines lead to a release of catecholamines, especially dopamine. So thus, the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia is born. So, all of your typical neuroleptic drugs. So these are the um, the first generations of antipsychotics we're going to talk about. All of them are antagonists of the dopamine D2 receptor. So this also leads to the dopamine hypothesis. And so the thought is that schizophrenia results from excessive synaptic dopamine or increases in postsynaptic sensitivity to it. So one of the thoughts with this, or one piece of supporting information, I guess you'd say, is that if this is the case, you'd anticipate that the effectiveness of a antipsychotic would, you know, be associated, strongly associated, with how much it blocks the D2 receptors, right? And um, it turns out that that really is the case. So here, what we're looking at is how much it's inhibiting the dopamine receptor and the clinical dose. And what we see is that there's a very strong correlation between the therapeutic dose and the inhibition of dopamine um, or the D2 receptor. So with this, it looks like you just need enough of the dose to you know block enough of the D2 receptor. So Again, this is pretty good evidence that perhaps it has something to do with that dopamine D2 receptor, and blocking that may be what's leading to these beneficial treatment outcomes. However, there are some problems with this hypothesis that we'll go into. Um, one is that, of course, with this hypothesis, it all is based on the fact that individuals with schizophrenia must have um, 
high levels of dopamine, right? But what we see is that uh, individuals with schizophrenia actually have normal dopamine metabolite levels, meaning that they most likely have normal dopamine levels. Also, drugs that block the dopamine D2 receptors um, do so much faster than we see symptoms being reduced. We'll talk about a possible reason for this, um, how these drugs may work. And of course, some patients, um, about 30% of patients, show no change. So why would it work for some and not for others if this was truly the mechanism at play? So why would it take a while for these drugs to take effect? Why would it take several weeks when the, the, it starts blocking them almost immediately? Well, antipsychotics block both the postsynaptic and the presynaptic receptors. So with this, the presynaptic receptors of course are autoreceptors. So those are the ones that are sensing how much dopamine is in the synapse, and um, they adjust accordingly based upon that. So what happens and when, when these are blocked, it gives the cell the, um, the signal that there's not enough dopamine. So what happens is that there's an increase of firing, an increase of the release of dopamine. And so with this, in the brief period of time after this happens, there's an, actually an increase in dopamine in the synaptic cleft, or at least that's the hypothesis. However, uh, the cell can't do this forever. And after a few weeks, the neuron cannot maintain this activity, so it eventually has a decreased firing rate. So eventually it goes back to normal. It just can't keep firing that quickly. So as a result of this, there no longer is an excess of release of dopamine. And um, with this, the overall, the dopamine synthesis and the amount of dopamine in the synapse goes down. And that's what's causing your clinical effect, potentially. So as you see, we have the electrical activity of the firing of dopamine cells. All these go down, and the thought here is that it's this decrease in dopamine activity that's causing the clinical improvement. So there is some evidence for this. You know, the time course makes sense. We have seen um, that this has this occurs in animal studies, and also what we see is the dopamine metabolites. Uh, go up first in, initially in treatment, and then they go down. So it kind of fits with the story. Another piece of evidence for this is, of course, when dopamine activity is reduced, psychotic symptoms get better. So the thought here, the argument here, is that the psychosis must be due to some abnormalities. Um, some increase either in dopamine activity, or remember, it could also be an increase in sensitivity. So even though there are, um, there may not be excessive amounts of dopamine in the synapse, that's not to say that the cells aren't, for some reason, artificially overly sensitive to the dopamine. So by bringing this down, you reduce the symptoms, even if you haven't actually cured the underlying defect. So with this, the hypothesis predicts that there's something wrong in the brain of individuals with schizophrenia. Um, but it's not baseline dopamine levels. So it must be something with the dopamine receptors. Again, it could be sensitivity. So with this, um, well, what do we know? Well, first, post postmortem, so after death studies, um, have looked at this, and some studies do show an increase in D2, but not D1 receptor density. So that would be that would be indicative of you know dopamine may be important here. Um, but with this, there have also been PET scans, and they're not as conclusive as those other studies. So it's still it's not clear whether or not there's actually this increase in sensitivity that's causing um, the dopamine sensitivity.
there's also the glutamate hypothesis. So I still like the dopamine hypothesis, but it's worth talking about the glutamate hypothesis because this is hot right now. Um, so people have argued dopamine hypothesis is a bust, so you can make arguments for it as we just did. So we need a new hypothesis, so enter the glutamate hypothesis. So much like the other hypotheses, it's correlational. Um, so originally designed to cause a dissociative amnesia state in which an individual is partially responsive but insensitive to pain, PCP was found to cause symptoms that strongly resembled the positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. So stop me if you've heard this one before. Uh, so with this, further chronic um, use of PCP can actually precipitate the development of schizophrenia. So thus it's thought that whatever causes these effects in PCP may also do the same in schizophrenia. So what does PCP do? It's a non-competitive NMDA receptor antagonist, which blocks the effects of glutamate, the main excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. Uh, for reasons you don't need to know, this hypothesis can also explain why antipsychotics, um, or why atypical antipsychotics are effective, as serotonin levels and glutamate levels are related. But that's a different story. Um, so anyway, it's thought that there's an excessive level of glutamate in individuals with schizophrenia. So a lot of books are now gung ho on. Um, the glutamate hypothesis, my biological psychology textbook being one of them. So why don't I like it? Why do I hang on to that old, trustworthy, correlational dopamine hypothesis? Well, the reason why I hold on to it is we blocking D2 receptors works. And both typical and atypical antipsychotics block D2 receptors, at least to some extent. We don't have evidence yet that reducing glutamate effectively treats schizophrenia. In fact, a study in 2009 found that glutamate antagonists failed to outperform both atypical antipsychotics and a placebo. So thus, until there's evidence that actually reducing glutamate um, can treat schizophrenia, I'm one that will stick with the old hypothesis. So, Thorazine. So, Thorazine was the first um, antipsychotic that was discovered, and it was discovered, like so many, by chance. So, with this, it's actually designed to be an antihistamine, and it got tried on psychiatric patients, and what we saw is that they responded very well. Uh, a lot of these... Um, a lot of the psychoses that we saw that yeah, up until this point we were just hospitalizing people for were gone, which is awesome. And it really, it also really calmed people down. You can see the, um, the ad here. When the patient lashes out against them, Thorazine quickly puts an end to violent outbursts. So it's, it calms down that aggressive behavior as well. And you, here you can see the effect of um, antipsychotics on institutionalization. Now there are also political things that came in with came into play with this, but you can see it really revolutionized psychiatry. You know, gone were the day that hundreds of thousands of people were inpatient. People were quickly being deinstitutionalized and able to go out and live productive lives in the community, which is awesome. So the success led to intense searches or an intense search for more drugs that would relieve uh, psychotic symptoms like this. So we've been doing this for 50 years now, a little more than that, it's like around 60, almost 60. And there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is we have many drugs like Thorazine that can reduce at least some of the symptoms of schizophrenia. Again, mostly the positive symptoms. Some of the bad news, they don't help everyone. No, no treatment does. Uh, not all the symptoms are improved. And we talked a little bit about the 
negative symptoms being hard nuts to crack earlier. And several of them have really nasty side effects, which we'll talk about as we go through here. So what do these drugs do to schizophrenia, schizophrenia symptoms? Well, at first it just makes people sleepy. So during the first couple of weeks, people just tend to feel sedated. It's not why it works, it's just the way people feel at first. It takes a couple of weeks for the symptoms to start abating. So people stop hearing the voices, paranoia and suspiciousness go down, speech becomes more coherent, people do a lot better with self-care, and emotionally they're more responsive. So you can see a pretty broad improvement in people, but again, this is more so the positive symptoms than the negative symptoms. So the book says, and this I agree with, um, it was mostly talked in with the first generations here, but really in my mind, after looking at the literature, I don't think there's a clear best antipsychotic. Um, it's really more of a question of side effects, as we'll talk about. There, are, All these have significant side effects that you have to consider. So with the first generations, they all were about equally effective. The main difference was how potent they were, as we, we showed with that earlier slide. So it just, um, how much of the drug you had to give in order to have an effect. That's your main difference. They were physically safe, meaning that you weren't going to die from overdose. You weren't going to have highs and you weren't going to have tolerance. But especially for the typical, the, the first generation antipsychotics, there were several, several, several very significant side effects. So the first one's dystonia. So this is abrupt spasms of the tongue and face, and it often required immediate medical attention. Um, you also have the extrapyramidal um, side effects. So with this, um, remember that dopamine is very much associated with movement. So that's, again, with Parkinson's, you have death of dopamine-producing cells, and you have all the movement disorders because of that. That's going to be important with these medications. So with that, when you have a medication that reduces the effect of dopamine, you can start getting some of those um, Parkinsonian-like symptoms. So that's what extrapyramidal symptoms are. So actinesia is essentially a loss or impairment of voluntary physical movement. So someone could be told to walk forward and could just stand there truly not being able to walk because it's just not working for them. So it, these look a lot like negative symptoms. So this is where I get a little nervous with the claims that um, that certain medications work for negative symptoms. It's hard to say because especially if you're comparing them to another antipsychotic, it's possible that the side effects basically are negative symptoms. They look like negative symptoms. So if you have a medication that has fewer side effects, it may not be that it's reducing the negative symptoms, but rather it's possible at least that it's just um, reducing a reduction that side effect. It's still a good thing, but I'm just nervous about those claims. You also have a restlessness. People sometimes pace or you know, also have kind of an anxiety feeling to it. Uh, this is often the most distressing part to the patient. There's also a neuroleptic malign uh, malignant syndrome, which is a very dangerous, life-threatening condition. It's rare, but you have muscle rigidity, fever, autonomic instability, and um, kind of changes. You basically, um, you, so you have this combination of symptoms that cause delirium and are potentially life-threatening. So some other side effects, um, sedation. So a lot of these have a histamine action, and you guys know about histamine already. So we do see some sedation with a lot of them. 
Uh, you can have hypotension, so reduced blood pressure. Um, lowered seizure threshold. Several of them have lower seizure threshold, so you have to be careful if you have anyone with a seizure disorder. Uh, photosensitivity, so that's uh, sensitivity to the light. And anticholinergic side effects, so constipation, dry mouth, blurry vision, memory problems. And then the one that people know probably the best is tardive dyskinesia. So it's called tardive because it's late, it comes tardy. And these are neurological symptoms that are the most feared because they're potential, well, they can be irreversible. And what's hard is that they can appear often, you know, months or even years after treatment began. Um, Long-term outcome is variable. Some people do recover, others don't. And it's not always clear how best to treat them. Um, because here you have someone where you don't want to take them off the antipsychotic because they could relapse, but then you don't want to increase it because the tardive dyskinesia could get worse. So it really puts you in a bind with these typical antipsychotics. So another problem with the typicals is about 30% of patients don't respond. So this is actually significantly better than we've seen for a lot of classes of medication. But still, that's a significant number of people that don't respond. We mentioned there are very serious, sometimes intolerable side effects. And Negative symptoms, by and large, are not improved with this class of medication. With the second and third generation, you can argue it. Here, you really can't argue it. The negative symptoms aren't getting better with these. So this led to the development of the atypical antipsychotic drugs. So these are the ones that you guys have probably seen a lot more of in your practical work. So here's a list of them and when they were developed. So many of these names are going to look familiar to you. We're going to be talking about most of these in um, some, well, not most, but half of them in some detail. So what differentiates the atypical or second or third generation from the first generation or the typical antipsychotics? Well, the big thing here, it's not it's kind of like what we've seen with antidepressants and these other medications. It's really not a difference in efficacy. It's a difference in side effects. So, though there may be some improvement with efficacy, we'll talk about that. So, you see here, with the traditional, there's a very small gap in between the effective dose and where you start to have these extrapyramidal side effects. And they were really kind of thought of as, you know, the side effects are part of it. For it to be effective, you're going to have some side effects. Um, it's just trying to find the right balance. With the new generation, you have a much wider gap because they work differently. What you're going to see is they still um, affect the D2 receptors, but typically to a much lower level. They don't affect them nearly as strongly. But what you do see is um, they also affect um, the serotonin receptors, as you'll see, um, and that, well, again, we won't go too much into mechanism, but that seems to play a role. So, with the older drugs, a um, couple things. So, you had two classes of the older drugs, and one of the problems that we saw is that these drugs were unable to separate antipsychotic efficacy from the Parkinsonian-like movement effects. So again, basically this is where if you had one, you had the other. If it worked, you're going to have some extrapyramidal effects. Uh, you're going to have some Parkinsonian movement effects. So it's more a balance of trying to find how much can you, you know, can you get to an effective dose at a level that you can tolerate. And that's really where the second generation improved. So again, you have a different action here. You have the dopamine receptor antagonism, especially the D2. And you also have serotonin 5-HT2 antagonism. So you have two effects here. So that's the main difference um, between the first and the second generation. And between the second and the third generation, it's typically that the third generation differs from this formula in some way. All the 
second generations are going to have some D2 blockade and some 5-HT2 blockade. So then again, third generation drugs, more complex mechanism of action, we'll get into it a little bit. It's not necessarily that dopamine and serotonin blockade. And we're, they're being asked to do more than just schizophrenia now. So we're more demanding on these new antipsychotics. Um, we really are focusing more on affects. Um, the thought here is you'll see a lot of these drugs are actually somewhat similar to antidepressants, um, trying to address those negative symptoms. Um, they're being used more in the prodromal phases of schizophrenia. And they're, as you'll see, being used for a lot of disorders outside of schizophrenia. So before we go on too much, before I tell you about all these medications, let's first talk about how effective they are. So a lot of information on the slide. It's from a huge study, but a couple things I really wanted to point out. So here you have a typical antipsychotic compared to a bunch of atypical antipsychotics. So you have Seroquel, you have Zyprexa, Geodon, Risperdal, you know, a lot of drug names you know. So first thing that I think is important, 74% of participants stopped the medication before the end of the study. And you can see this isn't just you know, people getting off the typical antipsychotic. This is all of them. You know, you have 82% jumping off a of Seroquel. So there are significant side effects, even with the atypicals, that lead to very poor uh, treatment adherence. And we'll talk about some of the ways that that's being addressed. Uh, so some of these, we'll get more into these, but for, um, for Alantapine or Zyprexa, weight gain is a huge issue, and also metabolic effects. Um, these medications can drastically increase the likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes. So, yeah, that's pretty significant. Um, not surprisingly, our first generation, our typical antipsychotic, had more extrapyramidal effects. That doesn't surprise us. So, another thing that was notable is that our first generation antipsychotic was as effective as all the atypical agents. No significant difference. So you may see some little differences with insignificance between these, but typically, at least in my reading of the literature, for what it's worth, you're again not seeing a big difference in efficacy with the atypicals. So it's not that they're more effective, it's that they have fewer side effects, though they still have pretty significant side effects. And that's backed up by another study. So this is the British version of the same study. And what they found is no clear clinical advantage of the second generation antipsychotics over the first generation agents in terms of treating schizophrenia. Now there may be some advantages in relapse prevention, Obviously, lower uh, metropyramidal side effects, start of dystonesia. So there are some advantages. The problems with the second generation are that they're expensive, weight gain, we'll talk about many of them have problems, and same with the metabolic problems. So there are significant side effects with them. All right, with no more ado, no further ado, let's get into the um, atypicals. So Clozarel. Clozarel was your first second generation atypical antipsychotic. It was actually made by the same company that made Ovaltine. Uh, it's now called Novartis. And um, so with this, good and bad thing. So let's talk about the good first. Down here is a very good part. In people who did not respond to the typical antipsychotics, about 30% of those did improve um, with this medication. So it's helping a lot of treatment resistant people. So that's notable. It has practically no um, Parkinsonian side effects or tardive dyskinesia. Um, 
So you don't have that those movement side effects that were so damaging with the typical anisotonics. And like typical of these, you know, whether or not it helps with the negative symptoms is controversial. Personally, I don't think so, but for what it's worth, you know, it's you can read the literature and decide for yourself on it. Um, it's just, it's hard to tell from the studies that are out there, in my opinion. So now there are some important um, negatives to this medication. So one of them is reversible adrenulocytosis. So this is a reduction in white blood cells. And there are actually some people early on that died because they had such a reduction that they died from um, infections. The good news is that when you find that this is happening, you can take the person off the medication, it goes back up. But it's something you have to be cautious with. The other problem you see is, you can see here, two big um, side effects that are very, very common. So sedation affects about 40% of people. And um, the weight gain, again, a lot of these you're going to see a lot of weight gain. Um, affects about 80% of patients. So a ton of people experience this, and 20 pounds or more is not unusual. So it's this is one of the worst of the antipsychotics. Um, Zyprex is also bad, as we'll see. But um, you can imagine that uh, treatment adherence is probably pretty poor when you have a medication that's going to make you gain 20 pounds. And that's also part of the reason why... Um, we believe that there is a, a, a metabolic effect, a negative metabolic effect. So how does this medication work? Well, the main thing is it blocks the dopamine D2 receptors, and we think that this is a big part of why it works, of course. But there are some other effects that we see um, that lead to some of the um, side effects. So we, it's um, an antagonist of histamine receptors. So this produces the drowsiness that we've seen in other medications. And I can go in later on, if you want, I can go into the thoughts and why this may be. Um, it's correlational anyway, but we think that this is why there's weight gain. It also affects um, alpha adrenergic um, that system. It's an antagonist. So it can cause dizziness and decrease blood pressure. And then it also is an anticholinergic. So it blocks some acetylcholine receptors, the muscarinic ones. So this is where you have some drowsiness, dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation. And you can also have cognitive impairment. Remember, acetylcholine is very important for cognition. So here you have a medication that you're given to people who often already have some level of cognitive impairment due to the disorder. And you're given a medication that can cause more cognitive impairment. So just something to consider. Um, risperidone or risperdol. Um, it's also one of these medications that both, it's second generation, so it blocks both serotonin and dopamine. And with this, of course, we think the dopamine is the one that really leads to the antipsychotic effect. But with this, it does block the dopamine a little bit more than Clozerol does. So one of the side effects is you can still have those extrapyramidal effects, but it's really only at high doses. Um, another thing, this is a rare side effect, but um, it can, through mechanisms I won't go into, uh, lead to an increase in release of prolactin. And what that does is it can create breasts in men, as you see here, or it can also cause uh, women to lactate. So not overly common, but it can happen. Overall, it's been viewed as a first-line drug, despite having lower efficacy than clozapine, because it also has lower side effects. And it's used for a bunch of things, um, autism and uh, developmental disorders, um, aggression, conduct disorder, things like that. In Vega, so why do we randomly talk about this with Risperdown? Well, this is one of those that's, you know, 
Ah, the drug companies are so smart. So it's a new molecular entity that got a new approval and a new 17-year patent light, when really all it is is risperidone has an active metabolite. So after it's initially metabolized, the metabolite also has an effect. All NVIDIA is is the active metabolite. So very similar effects to risperidone. Um, and probably, honestly, not worth the extra money. So, one of the benefits with uh, risperidone, and we'll see this with a couple of the medications, is there is actually a long action injectable form. Again, compliance is really bad with these, um, especially since some, many of them have um, dosing that requires two to three doses a day. That can be tough. So with that, there is an injectable form that's a um, intramuscular dose that can last up to two weeks. So you just get a shot every two weeks, you're good to go. So it's one of the things that could increase um, compliance. The question is, why is there poor adherence? Is it that people are forgetting to take it? You know, this would fix that. Or is it because of the side effects? This does not help with that. Olanzapine or Zyprexa. Um, it's like clozapine in many ways, but it doesn't have the white blood cell problems. So it works as both a dopamine D2 receptor blocker and a 5-HT2 blocker, but more so the latter, more so the uh, serotonin blocker. It also blocks acetylcholine receptors, so it's anti in it. Um, <sighs> Again, I'm always nervous when I say it um, improves negative symptomology. I I looked at the literature again on this. It's mixed, but there is some literature showing it. So I'll I'll put an asterisk by it. I'll feel better with that. The biggest side effects here, much like what we see with clozapine, weight gain and sedation. As far as if it's worse or better than clozapine, it's it's with the weight gain, it's very close, but you can have a lot of weight gain, as we'll see on the very next slide. So with this, they had um, 50 hospitalized adolescents, because adolescents actually seem to show more weight gain than adults, unfortunately. So 50 hospitalized adolescents, and they, for a group that got haloperidol, no change in weight, those that got olanzapine, had an increase of 7.2 um, kilograms, which was 11% of their body weight. And those with risperidone had a f um, four kilogram increase. So an increase of 6% of body weight. So these are big increases. So the conclusion was that olanzapine and risperidone are associated with extreme weight gain in adolescence, and it's higher than the amount reported in adults. So keep that in mind if you're seeing kiddos, that um, this is going to be a side effect that's going to be an issue. Now, sometimes side effects are helpful. So one thing that we've seen is olanzapine with anorexia. So when you give olanzapine to anorexia patients, we see a reduction in depression, anxiety, reduction of eating disorder symptoms, and a significant increase in body weight. So, you know, one man's side effect is another man's positive treatment outcome, or woman's. So, like what we've seen with the other medications, there's also an intramuscular Zyprexa um, that can be that can be administered as well. So the efficacy of this is actually better than several of the other intramuscular medications, but it's just one of several options, and I'll mention this again with another medication, but the intramuscular option is there. So, you know, if you're worried about it, treatment adherence, it's an option. Okay, so um, Seroquel. Seroquel, we all see quite a bit. So here it's a 5-HT and D2 antipsychotic, so again, second generation. It's related to clozapine. The big difference here is we have some improvement with side effects.
So we don't have weight gain. That's a big deal. Um, we don't have the white blood cell problems. That's nice. Um, so it does actually reduce glutamate. That's one. In addition to doing, you know, the 5-HT D2 thing up here, it does reduce glutamate. Um, so that's consistent with that glutamate hypothesis we talked about, at least potentially have you know, consistent. Though it's not significantly more effective than the other NSA products. Um, Half-life is seven hours. So the downside is you're going to be taking this medication two to three times a day. So adherence can sometimes be an issue. Another plus with this, though, is you'll remember that um, with some of these medications, there are negative effects on cognitive functioning. This one seems to have a potential benefit on cognitive functioning. So that's also a benefit for Seroquel. Geodon, so this is the SIDS they typical that is approved. And it was initially removed because of fears of cardiac arrhythmias. Now it's back. We're going to talk about the um, arrhythmias in a second here because it affects more than just Geodon. So the good news is like Sarah 12, you really don't have the weight gain. So that's awesome. So how does this work? Well, it's a 5-HT1A agonist. So it's like uh, Boosperone in that. And it's a moderate inhibitor of the 5-HT, uh, so serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake. So kind of like the tricyclates and SSRIs. So therefore, basically acts as an antidepressant. And it may improve depressive symptoms and potentially gain some of those negative symptoms. Um, the biggest side effect we have here is QT prolongation. Now, what is QT prolongation? So the QT interval is the time for the ventricle of the heart to electronically discharge and repolarize. Prolonging and prolonging this can lead to cardiac arrhythmias, so irregular heartbeats, and potentially death. So there are several medications that do this and have been pulled off the market. Book talks about more than these. And then several of the um, medications that we've talked about also do this. And um, so with this, what do we do? Well, for some of these medications, for the ones that do lead to QT problems, it's often recommended you do an ECG before you um, give this prescription. And for patients you know, with electrolyte problems or heart problems, it may not be the best medication to do. And unfortunately, where we do see more of an effect, even though um, as far as actual like cardiac problems, there's less of a literature on it, but we do see a pretty decent effect on QP, QT prolongation in kids. So they had 20 kids um, who were given the medication, um, and what we saw was a pretty decent effect on QT prolongation, pretty decent increase for one, even 114 milliseconds, which is significant. Um, so with this, the medications can significantly lengthen, lengthen the QT and put adolescents at risk of cardiac problems. So it's good to do monitoring of ECGs in children and adolescents taking these medications. So just another thing to be aware of. And lastly, it is one of the medications that you can, again, get a intramuscular injection for. So that is a benefit. Abilify. Abilify, you're seeing a lot of ads for um, as a adjunctive treatment for depression. We'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Well, we're almost at the end, but we'll talk about that a little bit. But Abilify is one of these third generations of antipsychotic drugs. So it's a, um, it's still an atypical antipsychotic, but it's not a purely, you know, dopamine D2 blocker like we've seen. In fact, it is a dopamine agonist. But the catch here is it's a partial dopamine agonist. So if you remember 
with partial agonists, it can have an antagonistic effect because although it has the same effect of dopamine, it doesn't have as strong of an effect. So overall, it reduces the effect of dopamine. So with this, since it's not blocking it, you don't have the QT prolongation, um, you don't see the waking, you don't have the extrapyramidal side effects. Here, that's on the next slide, but let me jump over there. So you don't see the extrapyramidal side effects um, at any dose. So that's a real benefit to this medication. You're, you don't have to worry about that. Whereas even with the atypicals, you still have to keep your eye on it. Uh, it's been used for a bunch of things. Uh, it's been used for bipolar mania, um, used in bipolar, psychotic um, disorders, of course, conduct disorder. Where I keep seeing it advertised, I grabbed a advertisement from the TV on this. Um, it's been used commonly as an augmenter for clinical antidepressants. So if your antidepressant's not working on its own, this is a medication that may be prescribed in order to help kick it into another gear. And it's also likely helpful in psychotic depression. So that's, the, that's my lecture on um, antipsychotics. Obviously, there are a lot more in the book. Some have been taken off the market, so I didn't include them. Uh, some have never been approved in the U.S., so I didn't include them. But it hopefully gives you an idea of how these drugs work. Again, D2, you know, D2 dopamine, I really think is important. There are people that will, there are naysayers, I guess you'd say. But to me, I'm still a fan of the dopamine hypothesis, though it certainly has its problems. Um, and like the other hypotheses, it's all correlational. But we know that affecting D2 works. And um, like so many other medications, I think really what we have to do here, we have a lot of drugs that we're just working on reducing the negative side effects. And that's good because a lot of these have a lot of negative side effects. But, and really poor adherence as you saw because of that. Um, so that's good, but again, I do think there's a need to focus on efficacy as well, especially on the negative symptoms where I'm still not convinced that they are all they're tracked up to be. But unlike the other ones, unlike antidepressants, I do give antipsychotics a bit of a pass just because there is so much work that needs to be done on reducing side effects that I understand the focus on that. Um, so antipsychotics overall, you know, these are drugs that have revolutionized the way we treat mental illness. It's enabled a lot of people to live outside the hospital that wouldn't have been able to otherwise, so they are really amazing medications. But we're not done yet. There's a lot more work to be done, and, um, and so, but it's an exciting time, as you can see, you know, with Abilify, there are new medications that are working in different ways, and, and hopefully we'll learn better ways to treat um, psychosis. So those are my thoughts. Um, hopefully we'll be able to chat in class briefly um, about this at some point. Um, uh, I don't know that I'll do it right before your exam, but we'll talk about them at some point. Um, because I look forward to your thoughts on the antipsychotics, which ones you'd use, maybe not use, why. So just think about that, but, um, but hopefully this was a helpful introduction to these medications and some of the pros and cons that you see with the medications.